Welcome to God's Planning, Contemplative Preachers, Contemporary Age. Each week, join the Dominican friars as they consider all things Catholic. Welcome to God's Planning. Uh, this, the uh, fourth Sunday of Lent, Laetare Sunday, not to be confused with Gaudete Sunday, which is during Advent. It's Laetare Sunday, fourth Sunday of Lent. Uh, I'm Father Jacob Burton Jancic. I'm here with Father Gregory Pine. Father Patrick Briscoe. Hi, fathers. Welcome to the show. This could be the sort so of like Sesame you. Street episode, right? L for Laetare. L is also for and Lent. Lent. <laughs> and for That's losing on our Lenten it. promises. So, oh my gosh. This is a real uh, motif yeah, you're that's working my theme with during Lent. During Lent. Yep. It's, Only it's God's beautiful. grace can heal you. It's great. Yep. Well, that's true. That's true. Um, right. So this fourth Sunday of Lent, we wear the color. What was it, Father Patrick? Rose? Please that don't say the it's just wears? pink. <laughs> it's just pink. Just say what you see. It is pink. Okay. We wear pink. Um, because <laughs> why? Well, because we're halfway through Lent. So I guess, right? I don't know. The numbers always are confusing but we're in the middle of lent and in the middle of lent the church gives us uh, a day to rejoice and a day to sort of have um yeah a bit of celebration lenten celebration uh to sort of encourage us to carry on with the rest of the season so here we are so we'll do our normal sunday lexio uh with you all get to our readings reflect on the readings for this sunday's gospel share with you some of our brilliant insights uh, that rival those of the fathers. And uh, here we go. We'll start with the collect and then we'll dive in. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, who through your word reconciled the human race to yourself in a wonderful way, grant, we pray, that with prompt devotion and eager faith, the Christian people may hasten toward the solemn celebrations to come, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All right, Father Gregory is going to take us to the first reading. First reading is from the second book of Chronicles. In those days, all the princes of Judah, the priests and the people, added infidelity to infidelity, practicing all the abominations of the nations and polluting the Lord's temple, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Early and often did the Lord, the God of their fathers, send his messengers to them, for he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his warnings, and scoffed at his prophets, until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. Their enemies burnt the house of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, set all its palaces afire, and destroyed all its precious objects. Those who escaped the sword were carried captive to Babylon, where they became servants of the king of the Chaldeans and his sons, until the kingdom of the Persians came to power. All this was to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, until the land has retrieved its lost Sabbaths, during all the time it lies waste it shall have rest while seventy years are fulfilled. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord inspired King Cyrus of Persia to issue this proclamation throughout his kingdom, both by word of mouth and in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me, and he has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever therefore among you belongs to any part of his people, let him go up, and may his God be with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's this uh, folksy Irish idea of um, this thing called thin places. And, uh, you know, other cultures have it too. And a thin place can be kind of a natural place um, or, or any other place where one is close to the sacred. And this is an idea that I think we have some kind of natural inclination to, right? Like, especially if we look upon a, a, a natural vista, you know, say, for example, the Swiss Alps, um, you know, and we see the magnificence of God and we can we can feel like that place is a thin place. And we can feel very close to God there. Um, but it also maps on to what the Lord has revealed about himself, that he dedicates some places as thin places, some places that are the actual dwelling 
places of God. So this is what this is what the Lord promises to the Jewish people that he will be with them, that there will be a place where God can be found, where God can be worshiped, a place um, where heaven and earth will always meet, a place where people below can contact, um, can touch the things of above. So this is the idea between uh, behind rather all the holiness codes of Leviticus and other books of the Old Testament where the Lord where the Lord promises that um, by by these rituals, places will be cleansed and will be readied for him. Um, one of the things that I love about our Catholic faith is that we, we have much the same ideas. We, 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 we don't just bless our churches, we dedicate or solemnly consecrate them. You know, we drive out the spirits of evil from their very walls so as to make fitting dwelling places for God. Um, they are actually sacred spaces because God, we, we think that God actually lives there. And what we see in this first reading is the importance of cleansing such a place when it has been defiled. So you'll read, um, you know, in the news, I, we've seen last year the uptick of uh, Catholic churches that have been attacked, um, which is a terrible thing that these sacred spaces would be defiled, um, or even you know, God save us, but we've seen sins of the clergy where places have been defiled. And we've seen our bishops and uh, other leaders in the church re-consecrating sacred places. We had that happen to us here at Providence College when our cemetery was defiled. Bishop Tobin came and re-consecrated our cemetery, blessed it, drove, you know, drove forth the spirits of evil from it so that our brothers could continue to rest there in peace. I think this is very important to us that we need we need to recall this, to say it, to teach it to our children, um, and to really believe it in our hearts that it's different to go to a sacred place than it is to not be in a sacred place. One way to um, to read scripture, one way to well, a good way. There are many ways, but a good way to read scripture is to look at look at what is given to us in the Word, um, and ask the question of what does this teach us? What does this teach me about God? Um, what do I? What is God revealing in these words? Uh, and then also, what is God revealing about me? in these words what is he teaching whether that's about like humanity whether it's about me as an individual we can do this on you know any kind of different level sort of the macro macrocosmic level microcosmic level um but it's it's a good exercise when we're looking at at scriptures to ask what does it teach about god and what does it teach about me and and not in disjointed ways but in in a connected way so what does it mean then about my relationship with God? And if we were to look at this first reading in that way um, that we have today, there, there's sort of a summary of, of what's gone on in the book of Chronicles, right? So you have you have the, the Israelites, the chosen people of God who behaved unrighteously and who scorned the prophets. Uh, you have their the ensuing Babylonian exile, their punishment, um, their self-inflicted punishment really for rejecting God. And then you have King Cyrus, the Persian, who recalls or reorders, as Father Patrick was describing, the, this temple, this temple worship, who brings the Israelites, and not a Persian who brings the Israelites back to the temple. So you kind of have this, this, this track here that we can follow. It describes on a macrocosmic level what happened with the Israelites, but we can also think about these steps with respect to ourselves. You know that remember to recall our baptisms that in our baptism we are made um we're made holy in the eyes of god we're made sacred we're made we're, we're become the adopted sons and daughters of god but our sin also um our sin has that is self-inflicted that we choose to do ruptures ruins hurts that relationship with god um, but we're also called, as Father Patrick was describing, to through the sacrament of penance and through the graces of the sacraments to return to be reconsecrated as a sort, um, to be healed and and put back into right relationship with God. So when we read these Old Testament readings that can sometimes see sort of, seem sort of, um, I don't know, kind of hard to kind of enter into or kind of just so far away or kind of so chock full of details and people and places that it just kind of seems to be an unrelatable thing. Remember that in these in these circumstances and in these um, in these recounting of of Israelite history and these sorts of things that our Lord is also revealing to to me, to you. Um, so how is it that you fit in? Well, remember that that we are in virtue of our baptism, we are God's sons and daughters, His adopted sons and daughters. That we have sinned, we are sinners, but there's a Savior. 
that God wants to continually recreate us in his grace. Uh, this is, we kind of fall neatly in that way into the, into the story of salvation history, which is, I think, pretty, pretty cool, but also uh, pretty, uh, a great cause of, of hope, of hope. Just to pick up a little bit on something that Father Patrick described, um, this idea that God is wed to a place. I'm struck by the line, for he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. Uh, you don't typically think of compassion as, you know, potentially ordered to a place, uh, but it goes to show the kind of peculiar logic of the temple and its cult in the life of Israel. Um, because not only is the Lord present to it, you know, in a kind of morally neutral or aloof way, as if he were to kind of visit himself on the temple, but without any real affection for the spot. It's it's just the case that the Lord, when he draws near to his people in his tabernacle in glory, uh, he expresses it in terms of love, right? He expresses it in terms of solicitude, in terms of compassion. And so you see, like, the whole trajectory of salvation history is an expression of this love for his people and his temple. And you see that come to fulfillment. You see it come to perfection in Christ. Uh, so last week, the gospel was taken from John 2 with the cleansing of the temple. And in part, that gesture, uh, or by that gesture, the Lord himself identifies uh, his body as the new temple in which we'll worship. In John 4, he talks, you know, you're not going to worship on Mount Zion or on Mount Gerizim, you're going to worship in spirit and truth, which in John 1 is identified with the Logos, with specifically the flesh of the Logos. So whereas, you know, the Lord's compassion and love is localized in the cult of the people of Israel on the Temple Mount, when the Lord comes to fill the temple with his presence, uh, but also to bring that presence into the life of the church and into the sacramental order, he changes the way in which the Lord's compassion is, is kind of ordered, as it were. Not that there's a change in God, but there's a change in our appreciation of his love. And now it's not so much that, you know, like the Lord dwells in this particular space behind the veil in the Holy of Holies, where pleasing sacrifices offered once a year and other sacrifices are offered daily, but it's that the one sacrifice in our Lord Jesus Christ has been offered once and for all, and that his solicitude, his love, his compassion now comes to reach us because he's already taken our human flesh, and that flesh is, you know, associated with him as an instrument for our salvation. You know, like there's nothing of our humanity that is foreign to him, never was, but especially in the incarnation, he makes it known that he's taken all of it to himself so that he can love us, so that he can express his solicitude, so that he can express his compassion through all of it. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, I mean, there's this, this passage at the end of Second Chronicles, which is not really the most inspiring book of the Bible. It's like long lists of weird names and things like that. And here you have like salvation history encapsulated in exile, and all of it just comes to this kind of anticipatory fever pitch, which sets the stage for the coming of Christ, who loves us in a, uh, in a very peculiar way. With that, we will move to the, to the second reading. Father Patrick will take us there. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love he had for us even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. By grace you have been saved, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from you, it is the gift of God. It is not from his works, so no one may boast. For we are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God had prepared in advance, that we should live in them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So often I get asked as a, well, I guess, in as a vocation director, perhaps more, but also as um, a Dominican who, you know, as being a member of a religious community, what is Dominican spirituality? What does Dominican spirituality looks like? Or what does it look like? And I don't think that, I think it's a bit anachronistic to say there is, this is Dominican spirituality. I think there is Dominican life that we live, but, um, and that contributes to a larger picture. And I think that that is the same with respect to the Christian life. So you can say, well, what does it mean to have a Christian spirituality or what is Christian or Catholic spirituality? And we could describe various things, you know, the sacramental life, the un a proper understanding of grace and, and all of these kind of things. Um, uh, but I don't know if we can say that there is one 
um, this is what it is. And if you don't meet all these these sort of checklists, then somehow uh, and somehow there's some deficiency. Um, what I do think we can identify, though, is different ways by which to approach our relationship with Christ. And I think here in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, um, that he gives us one one way and a way to shape our relationship with Christ and shape our spiritual life, and that is this this idea of participation. Um, this this whole section from uh, from Ephesians is all about our sort of understanding that you know, as Saint Paul says in here, that we are God's handiwork, that we are saved through Him. And in 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 the fifth and sixth verses here of the second chapter, um, Saint Paul does something pretty pretty interesting or, or sort of catch our attention. He says that it, the, the line says, brought us that Christ brought us to life with Christ by the grace you have been saved, by grace you have been saved, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens. Um, this threefold repetition of with, with, with um, reminds us of Christ's, um, Christ's command or explanation that, that uh, without him, we can do nothing. But with him, we can. You know, with him, we can be raised. With him, we can tr- be transformed. And I think this ought to inform uh, our 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 life of pursuing virtue, our life of grace, our life of uh, our, our spiritual life, our prayer life. That it's it's with him. Everything that we do as as Catholics is is aimed at being more receptive, being better able to receive the grace that he's giving us and being better able to respond, to participate, to participate in the divine life that's on offer with Christ, with him. Um, So I think it's beautiful that St. Paul gives this um, sort of this reminder halfway through Lent as the church gives it to us for for this reading that what we're doing in this time of Lent in our whole Christian life, what our whole spiritual life as Christians, if we want to say that, should look like is a with Christ, God first moving, but with him. Um, and in that, there, there's great power, there's great strength as a Christian. Um, yeah, so just to draw out this theme of being with Christ, um, there's this character of Christ's life that's exemplary, right? So Christ lives in his flesh what we are meant to live in ours, and we are saved to the degree and extent that our lives are conformed to his. Um, and as a result of which, I mean, every aspect of Christ's life matters because every aspect of Christ's life is addressed to us as salvation. And here on Light Tower Sunday, it's funny, like the readings give you a sense of both the passion and the resurrection. So on the first reading, you know, it was spoken of the, the time of exile, right? The destruction of the temple, but with a kind of hopeful looking forward to the fulfillment of the promise of Jeremiah, the laying fallow of the land and the bursting forth into new life with the dispensation of the second temple. And then here, there's this idea, okay, we were dead in our transgressions, but we're brought to life with Christ. And then, as we'll see in the gospel, there's this idea of exaltation, which carries with it the sense of both crucifixion and of resurrection. Um, And when St. Thomas reads passages on the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord, he says that we can kind of see a, a correspondence between the mysteries of Christ's life and our own spiritual lives, in the sense that by his passion, uh, he puts to death sin in our members, and by his resurrection— he raises us to new life. So if you think about it in terms of merit, for instance, all of the the deeds of our Lord Jesus Christ are infinitely meritorious. So all of them are sufficient to save us, right? So like at his conception, the Lord performs an infinitely meritorious act, which is enough to save us. But he lives a whole human life. He lives an integral human life from start to finish, right? From conception to death, to unnatural death. Um, And as a result of which, all of the details of that life are addressed to us as part of our own maturation in the life of grace, as part of our own confirmation to him, uh, and as part of our being drawn in to the life of the most blessed Trinity. So I just let you know, on Late Tara Sunday, as we mark a kind of midpoint in Lent, as we look both towards the passion and the resurrection, with a kind of, you know, dreadful expectation, which breaks forth into new life, we have this sense that we are to be conformed both to his passion and to his resurrection, and that you cannot have the one without the other, but we would not have it otherwise. At great risk of sounding like I have a heart, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about divine mercy. Um, the uh, recently we have celebrated the anniversary of the revelations of the divine mercy image um, to Saint Faustina. So that was the 90th anniversary of these um, of these revelations that the Lord gave to her. And divine mercy is such an interesting theological concept. I mean, it's it's actually very rich, and you you don't need to be stuck in um, 
ingest some kind of saccharine or sentimental piety to be to be talking seriously about divine mercy because God's mercy is so very rich. Um, and one of the things that I like to think about are the motives for God's mercy. Um, you know, where does it come from? Why does it come to us? Um, our God who is rich in mercy, what does this mean um, to say that this love of God, uh, you know, extends even to us? Um, so I think one one place we have to start is that mercy is a manifestation of God's own glory, um, that mercy is a divine action um, reaching out to us, and it shows that only only a glorious God would do such a thing. Um, I think that uh, I think that we have to think about divine mercy as revealing um, the holiness of God. That mercy is the kind of thing when extended to us makes us like God. It doesn't get stuck or mired in our human condition, but rather. Um, shapes our own hearts um, that, that we are by it we are made likened to God. Um, so it's so it's a it's connected to God's holiness and being poured out for us. Um, divine mercy extends to us um, through the love that the Father has for the Son. So we are conformed to the Son by virtue of our baptism. We're made like unto Christ, and it's through that love that the Son and Father sh- share you know, particularly that love that the Father has for the Son, that we're able to encounter um, God's love, to encounter his mercy. Um, I think this this is very, this is so very incredible uh, that we're sharing this kind of, um, this this love which is manifested to us through the Son, this love which is at the heart of who um, God is in himself, um, is being poured out uh, on us, and we call that mercy when it's poured out on us. Um, at the Shrine of Divine Mercy in Krakow, in Poland, the new basilica is very modern. And if you look up pictures of it, you'll see um, in its artwork, you'll see a little golden globe, and then there's kind of a halo over the globe, and a and a, a little red, a little red splotch, a little red heart or flame or something. I'm not even sure what the red thing is, um, but I do know that it refers to. I do know it refers to this uh, this idea that Jesus gave to Saint Faustina that the Lord told her that this spark of mercy would come from Poland and that it would reach the whole world. And I uh, I will say this that it is incredible the number of people that have been enriched um, by Saint Faustina's teachings, by her vision, by their experience of seeing the image of divine mercy. Um, by meditating on this uh, in- incredible love for God, um, and by the way, this very holy, very saintly sister um, presents it. So that's all for you, Father Bonaventure. Not that you'll listen to this, but um, for those of you that don't know, <laughs> Father Bonaventure is very <clears throat> devoted to Divine Mercy. Well, with Divine Mercy, uh, we will move on uh, to the Gospel. So here we go. <laughs> A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to Nicodemus. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned. But whoever does not believe has already been condemned, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come toward the light, so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel begins with this passage, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And the passage refers back to this scene in Exodus when the Lord sent seraph serpents among the Israelites and all who were bit fell ill, but those who looked on a brazen serpent held by Moses were subsequently cured. And, you know, it's a, it's a reference to the cross in the sense that the Son of Man will be lifted up on the cross, but there's an ambivalence about the term lifted up because it also denotes a kind of exaltation. And you might think at first, you know, what's exalted about the cross? It seems you know, awful in every respect. I mean, the Lord is raised on an engine of torture. How can we How can we exalt that in any way, shape, or form? And yet, you know, we hang the crucifix on our walls and around our necks. 
So there's this sense in which the cross is, is revelatory of a deeper mystery. It's revelatory both of the very nature of God and also of our destiny as Christians. So uh, St. Paul comments in Philippians 2 with this beautiful Christological hymn uh, that though Christ was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at, but rather emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. And you follow that hymn through its initial verses in this kind of movement of self-emptying, this movement of descent, but then the subsequent you know, parts of the passage describe a movement of exaltation. And, you know, you might think, okay, that's, I mean, that's a historical movement of salvation history. That's the historical movement of Christ's life. But it also reveals something of the inner life of God. And, you know, there are some theologians who say that, like, God is deprived of, your Christ is deprived of a sense of God on the cross. And we wouldn't hold for that because Father Thomas Joseph, who taught us Christology, would not abide such a thinking, um, but also because it's not true. <laughs> um, but there is the sense in which that you see a kind of self-emptying in the life of the Trinity, not that God ceases to be God or that Christ, you know, somehow seeds his Godhead, but that the very nature of God is a kind of giving forth, right? So the Father from all eternity begets the Son, and the Son and uh, Father, the Father and the Son from all eternity breathe forth the Holy Spirit. And, you know, you see this uh, in the in the crucifixion, in an especial way, when the Lord gives up His Spirit, right? It says that He He breathes forth the Spirit. So on the on the, on the cross, at the end of His earthly life, the Lord conjures the power, the strength to kind of bellow, as it were. It is finished, and then He breathes forth the Spirit. He sends forth the Spirit in the life of the Church. He sends forth the Spirit through the sacraments, right, which flow from His pierced side. And when we witness all these things, we see, you know, who 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 the Lord Jesus Christ is, but also who is God, right? Not just the second person of the most blessed Trinity, but the very Trinitarian life in all of its totality. And that becomes for us a pattern of our own salvation. So it's it's inescapable, right? That our lives are meant to be poured out. Um, you know, married people know this, and St. Paul reflects on it in Ephesians 5, that the very shape of married life is sacrifice, but that's more broadly true of Christian life in general. Uh, you know, they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Uh, but, but, you know, without without the song having to be sung, right? They, they'll know we are, we are Christians because we bear in our bodies the very marks of Christ. And we bear in our bodies the very marks of Christ unto the revelation of a God who is love poured out, right? From all eternity, love poured out in creation, love poured out in redemption, and love poured out in his body, the church. So that becomes for us a kind of object of contemplation during the season of Lent, so that we who are lazy, selfish, weak, otherwise inbent, might be broken open to the revelation of who God is so that we might become more like him in generosity of spirit and in service to our brothers and sisters. One of the unique qualities about the, the Gospel of John or unique characteristics, I guess that's the same thing as quality, but uh, is that in the Gospel of John, there are a series of, of um, episodes where our Lord has these sort of long dialogues where either he's speaking with somebody or speaking um, on his own, praying on his own. So we have here in, in John 3, the sort of end of um, his interactions with Nicodemus. Um, and then you have the Samaritan woman in John 4. And if we look at the end of the gospel, just by way of one more example, you have the Last Supper discourses. And this this is unique, especially compared to the gospel of Mark, which is kind of quick moving and these kind of things. But even with Matthew and Luke, you don't have these long Long discourses, and part of the the reality of these long discourses is um, is a sort of fulfillment of what is begun um, at or what is at the beginning of the Gospel of John that the Word became flesh, that the Word of God is is living and dwelling among us, and that the the people with whom our Lord interacts with, um, you know, He interacts with as. God. Um, he interacts with as their savior. Um, he interacts with as as the one who is truth. Um, so in that, in that interaction, in that sort of salvific um, relationship is, is presented this idea of eternal life and this sort of fleshing out through the gospel of what it is um, that is, um, that Christ has come to bring us, you know, namely eternal life. But Often, our mind might think eternal life or sort of divine life as something that's in the future, that's something that comes after we die. But what the Lord shows us through these conversations in the gospel, through these interactions um, throughout his earthly ministry, is that the that divine life, eternal life, at least in its quality, not in its duration, but in its sort of qualitative realities, it's, we can 
we can live with and live in certain characteristics of eternal life now, of the divine life now, if we are sort of willing to step into the light as this as as this gospel passage teaches us, that in interacting with and being in the presence of um, and offering our lives, as Father Gregory was describing in this sort of sacrificial way to the word, to Christ, um, we in turn, being, you know, receiving his mercy, receiving his grace, are able to share in that promise of eternal life now. We're given a foretaste of that. Um, we are called to live with him, um, you know, not in the fullness of heavenly beatitude, but with with a bit of a, a sort of preview, a bit of a foretaste of what's to come, um, simply by being with him. So through the gospel, as we, you know, are midway through Lent, as we're getting closer to Easter, our Lord is preparing our hearts and preparing our minds and, and saying to us, you know, listen, I'm here before you now. I will be before you in glory at the resurrection, um, but I'm, I'm working, I'm working to be with you, you know, to soften your heart to receive me now. And that is an offer for us, each of us. The House of Studies, uh, at least when we were in uh, in our formation years, and the House of Studies played annually the Marians of the Immaculate Conception in a softball game. And uh, as as listeners might know, the Marians of the Immaculate Conception are dedicated uh, particularly to the spreading of this message of divine mercy. Um, they run, in fact, the National Shrine for Divine Mercy in uh, Stockbridge, Massachusetts. So anyway, we were playing them in um, this annual softball game, and one friar came down from the house, and he had prepared a sign, you know, how people uh, people prepare signs for ball games, and uh, on his sign, which he had mounted to the top of, I think, a mop or something, right? Um, <laughs> his sign said, "No mercy," um, and it was this. Uh, it, it was hilarious. He marched around with it. Um, and uh, it made our, our softball game very much like an actual uh, sports encounter. Um, you know, some friars are decent enough at sports and others of us excel at uh, sitting on the sidelines. And then uh, some uh, get up to antics like uh, signs, you know, that say no mercy against the <laughs> Marians of the Immaculate Conception. The point is, uh, we can consider this all game. We can play around. Uh, we can we can send our slogans out. We can recognize John three sixteen at a softball game, um, or we can dig in and embrace what the Lord is offering us. Um, allow His grace, as Father Jacob Bertrand was saying, to transform our hearts. All right. Well, as we end our discussion, our Alexio on this Sunday's, on Laetare Sunday's readings, um, we'll, we will, um, well, I was going to say we're going to pray. We'll save that for the end, because I think, you know. Announcements the, first, the, you know, the, like Mass. You know, do the announcements. Right, the germ and says announce. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You know, I was, but I, I had gotten confused, you know. Pardon me. Forgive me. Fathers. That's why Thank you have you. to write everything um, down, Father Jacob Bertrand. I keep trying to tell you this, but you don't listen to me. That's cute. I'm about to mute your mic in a second, Father Patrick. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. So announcements, just like Sunday Mass, every, please be seated for some announcements. Um, so if, uh, as always, if you think someone might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. Uh, I think on our last Lexio, Father Gregory might have explained the, the joys of sharing and the simplicity of sharing podcasts. So um, I forgot what he said, but you can do that. It's joyful and it's simple. So feel free to share with somebody who you think might benefit from a little reflection on this Sunday's readings. Um, if you wouldn't mind, give us a like somewhere on YouTube, podcast things, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, super helpful for us. Uh, you can always check out our website, godsplanning.org, uh, if you're looking to support, to continue to give alms during um, during the Lenten season. You know, we receive alms during the Lenten season and outside Lent, but, you know, Lent is a good time to do that. Uh, <laughs> there's also some merchandise on our website, some pretty sweet stickers. I'm pushing the fanny pack. Uh, it's not, you know, that that's a new we might be trendsetters there. Nice fanny pack, you know, check that out. Um, otherwise, we will certainly be praying for you as we always do, but we will continue, especially during the season of Lent, pray for us too. And uh, with that, we will we'll conclude with the prayer over the people for the first, fourth Sunday of Lent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Look upon those who call to you, O Lord, and sustain the weak, Give life by your unfailing light to those who walk in the shadow of death, and bring those rescued by your mercy from every evil to reach the highest good, through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Until next time, God bless. Thanks for listening to God's Planning, a work of the Dominican Friars of the Province of St. Joseph. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Leave a review on your podcast app and visit us at godsplaining.org.